Daniel, the Old Testament. And you'll find Daniel, if you start right at the end of the Old Testament, go back a little bit, and you'll find Daniel amongst the minor prophets. And we want chapter 5. And if you want to know a little bit about what's going to happen in the future, you could read the book of Daniel. Beautiful book to read. Prophecy is in it. Daniel chapter 5, verse 1. Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine from the, uh, before the thousands. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded uh, to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem that the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines might drink their air. They uh, Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem, and the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines drank in there. They drank wine and praised the God of gold. Notice what they did. They drank wine and praised the God of gold and of silver and of brass and of iron and of wood and of stone. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed and his thought troubled him so that uh, the joints of his lines were loose and his knees smote one against another. Now down the, the chapter to verse 20. We don't want to read it all. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was disposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. Verse 22. And thou, his son, O Belshazzar, had not humbled thy heart, though thou knowest all this. Down to verse number 25 is his judgment, and this is the writing that was written. Meeny, meeny, tickle you far in. This is interpretation of the thing. Meaning God had numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tickle, thou art weighed in the balance and found wanting. Farzim. The kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. That's very, very important. Verse 30. In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. Now God can add a blessing to the reading of his word and give a little help as we think about these portions tonight. First of all, I want to think about Psalm 8. And in reading Psalm 8, I want to think about God in creation. The greatness of God in in creation. And then we want to think a little Exodus chapter 8, that goodness of God in conviction. God in conviction. God has brought you here tonight. Don't, understand, don't, don't underestimate it. Only, only God could bring you here. That's right. God has arranged everything that you would be here. Don't, don't, you know, God's hand, God's finger is in your life. That's right, God's finger is in your life and it's very important to acknowledge that. So the greatness of God in creation, the greatness of God in conviction, uh, the grace of God, when you come to John chapter 8, uh, in the grace of God seen in conversion. Because God's purpose in dealing with every single individual of the 8 billion on earth is that you might know him as your savior that you might trust the Lord Jesus and know him as the one who took your sins upon the cross, that you might be in heaven. Because a lot of people think, and a lot of the nations of the world think, you know that there are many ways into heaven. No, 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 don't, don't get it wrong at all. That's why it's important for you to read your Bible. Do you read your Bible? You think you can live your life and live your life without God and live your life without a Bible and live your life without reading it? Well, you might be able to do that. You just might be able to survive down here. You can't because that's your choice. You can ignore the Bible. You can ignore God. You can forget them down here. You will have difficulty. 
But you will, you, you will be able to last, you know, until you come to death. But listen, you will never, never, never be in heaven. It's God who made heaven, and it's God who made you, and he made you for heaven, but you know sin is the problem, and oftentimes people don't want to deal with their sin. They don't want to face their sin, and that's why they don't want to think about God, because God will continually remind you about your sin. So I want to think about the greatness of God in creation. I want to think about the goodness of God in conviction. And I want to think about the grace of God in conversion. Because that's what he wants you. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to know the Lord Jesus as your Savior. But then, lest you miss the message and you forget it and you want to ignore it, we just want to give you a little tiny warning at the end. That, you know, at the end, it was Daniel and even though God said in Daniel, even though you knew all of what you knew, Daniel, you knew what happened to your father, you knew what, how God dealt with him, and you ignored it, and now your day of the end is coming, and judgment. So it's the government of God in judgment. God's wheels roll slow. God is not willing that any should perish. He doesn't, he doesn't entertain and he doesn't think and he doesn't want any person to go to the column of death all by themselves and to land in a lost eternity. That's not the heart of God. That's why God is long-suffering. His wheels rolls very, very slow. He gives you opportunity and time to repent and he gives you uh, 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 the means. He sometimes speaks very, cloud, very loudly and very distinctly and very personally. That's why I said it's not an accident that you're here. Not at all. Because God has brought you here for a purpose that you might learn the truth from the Bible. Because this is where the truth is. There's no other book on earth like this book. This book is a living book. From Genesis to Revelation, every single word of the Bible is a living word. It's right from the God of heaven. It's what God has written that you might learn. Listen, and I've said it since I come here. B-I-B-L-E. Basic information before leaving earth. This is what God wants you to know. That's why oftentimes I ask my audience, have you got a Bible? Do you read your Bible? Because it's important. This is what God wants you to know before you leave here. He wants you to understand that there are dangers beyond the column of death. There is real danger behind the column of death. And therefore, he wants you to be prepared that you might, oh yes, you might go to the column of death, but he wants you to enter this only door that he has provided for all humanity to be able to be in heaven. And the only way that takes us into heaven, for the Lord Jesus said in John 10 and 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. And John 14, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. So the Bible is the truth. The Bible is about God. The Bible is about his son that came from the God of heaven down to earth to rescue humanity. The very moment Adam and Eve sinned against God, there was separation from God. And that separation can be taken away when you put your faith in the work of the Lord Jesus up on the cross. And the Old Testament was pointing to the cross, pointing unto the time when Jesus would come. And all the pictures and types of the Old Testaments and stories are all pointing to when Jesus would be born in the city of Bethlehem and he would go to the cross. And now the New Testament is pointing back to Calvary, and that the Lord Jesus has died for our sins upon the cross. I just want to think a little bit about the greatness of God as you think about, you know, Psalm 8, and which we read here, uh, and, uh, and uh, God's creation. You know, how can you, how can you look at God's creation, the stars, the moon, the sun, and all the universe... 
How can you look at the, the trees even? Can you imagine these trees that, that color in the fall and such beautiful colors and the leaves falls off and they grow back into the, in the, when the summer comes and they develop again during the summer and they fall off again. And can you look at all of God's creation and think there is no God? Is it possible that you can look even, you know, if you just sit down and I've sat down at times and just look at a little bee. When a little bee climbs around and goes into the flower and he comes over that flower and goes into another one and comes over that one and goes into another one and comes over that one and goes into another one and he'll fly right back to where he wanted to take what he was getting from the flowers. Can you look at all of this? the greatness of God in creation, and say there is no God. Tremendous when you think about it. I came from Labrador, and I lived on the coast of Labrador, and if you've never seen the Northern Lights in Labrador, then you have never really seen the Northern Lights. And the beauty of these lights... I've been into the mountains and there's no street lights and there's no street lights for hundreds of miles. And you see these northern lights as they come into the sky and they dance across the sky. The beauty of it, my friend, can you actually look at the God's creation and the greatness and the beauty and the depths of it? They have never gone beyond the depths. They're still exploring and finding stars and galaxies still out there going on and on and on and on. And they'll find it that there's no end to it because we have such a great God. And that God is your creator. Can you imagine 8 billion people on earth and not one of us got the same handprint? You think that happened by an explosion? And by just an accident, just accidentally, we are born and we ha have a different handprint? My friend, listen, it was the finger of God. The finger of a God of creation that had no beginning and will have no ending. I can't explain it. In fact, if I, my little intelligence and my little brain could explain God, then God ceased to be God. That's right. He goes far beyond whatever human being could ever think or imagine, my friend. Let us understand. Some just think tonight. I preached with a man from Prince Edward Island, and he says, I preach to make you think. Well, I try to do sometimes. Yeah, just to make you think. Stop tonight and think about the God of creation and his greatness. The glory of God. We've only seen a little tiny bit of it. That's all. He's shown that to us. God in creation, his greatness. But then when you come to Exodus chapter 8, the people of Israel is in bondage. God is going to deliver them. God is miraculously going to take a people from Egypt, the Israelites, out of Egypt and deliver them across the Red Sea and into the wilderness because he promised them a land and he's going to take them to the land. They could have been to the land a long time before they were, but of unbelief. And listen, you could have peace in your heart too a long time ago, maybe some of you, but you live in unbelief. You don't believe in God. You don't believe that God is great as he is. You don't believe that he really gave his son to die upon the cross for your sins and take away all your sins and give you peace in your heart? I taught that for a while too, but I found the truth as a boy of 16. Listening to the Bible, reading the Bible, and understand that I can have a personal relationship with the eternal God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a boy of 60, 10 minutes before 11, March 11th, 1969, I trusted the Lord Jesus as my Savior. I understood he was real, and he died for my sins upon the cross. But when you come to Exodus chapter 8, God is taking the people out. But Pharaoh was not going to let them go easy. 
They've been there for over 400 years, and they've been doing lots of work for him, and he doesn't want to let them go. But God is going to take them out. He is my friend. No matter how powerful Sapphira might be, God is going to deliver them. And therefore, he does there's 10 plagues there. You can read them in the chapters that we read here in Exodus. But this one, the magicians could do it. You know, God, Satan has power too. Don't underestimate it. He's real. He's a real person. Satanic powers is real. It's real. Don't, don't delve with it. Don't touch it. Not at all, my friend. It's frightening. It's, and, it's, and it's wicked. It's wicked. It's, a, it's, not, it's not the power of God. It's wickedness. And don't indulge. Don't, don't, don't touch it. Flee from it if you can. And uh, the magicians could do some of them too. But just listen now. As we look at this one a little tiny little bit closer. They, Moses, uh, you know, allow, God allowed Moses to put his, uh, his, uh, his, uh, his rod across the dust. And God brought life to every little piece of dust. He gave lice, made lice out of it. But the magicians couldn't do it. Why? Life is from God. And even though it was the smallest of life, a lice from a piece of dust... Satan couldn't do it because life comes from God. Your life came from God. It wasn't an accident. This isn't, you haven't revolved from a monkey. Not at all, my friend. You came from the omnipotent hand, the fingers of God. And the magicians had to admit, this is the finger of God. The finger of God has been guiding you too. That's why I remember a German boy coming to Canada. He came to get an engineering degree in Canada, Nova Scotia. God put him in the right class. There were three classes. He put him in the right one. He put him in the right seat too, right on side of a Christian. He didn't know that God was going to give him more than just an engineer degree from Canada. Maybe God has brought you into Canada far more for just an engineer degree. Or maybe just, just to be, you know, uh, safe here. Not at all. He wants you to understand the safest place you can be is not in just in Canada. It's in Christ. You need new life in him. And life comes from the finger of God. And these, these magicians had to learn that. They couldn't do it. Not at all. Because life is from God. Very important. Very important. But then when you come to chapter 8, and my time is slipping by, almost gone. When you come to chapter 8, there's a woman, and she's in sin, and caught in sin. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, right in the very act of sin, idolatry. And, you know, it's, uh, the, 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 there she was. And, and they brought her to the Lord Jesus, and, and the people were saying, we got to stone her to death. The law says stone her to death. Ah, the grace of God. You know, uh, the wages of sin is death. That's the law too. The wages of sin is death. Soul that sin it must die. But you know, listen, not only just physical death, it's spiritual death, because that this is death here, the second death, right? Separated from God is is a second death in eternity. The Lord doesn't want you to die like that. And he didn't he didn't condemn. He condemned the sin that the woman did, but he didn't condemn the woman. What he did is a, a, he, he spoke to all of them and he says, anybody here, if you want to stone this woman to death because of the law, anybody here that has no sin, that start casting the first stone. You know, you, you, you cast the first stone. And every single one of them, and if we all admit tonight before God, we all have sinned, every single one of us. But listen, God wants to forgive you your sins. That's, that's what Christ came for. He came to die upon the cross that he might be able, God might justly be able to forgive you your sins because God just couldn't put your, sweep your, your sins under the carpet or say, you know, just go on, you're, you're, you're okay now. You know, uh, uh, no, 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 no. He already stated that the wages of sin is death. The soul that sinned must die. And therefore, if our sins is going to be paid for justly before God, 
then somebody must die for our sins in order for God to be able to forgive us our sins. And that's why he sent his son. He sent his son from heaven to go to the cross, and he punished his son upon the cross. And now, because Christ died for our sins, he can forgive us our sins if we believe in him. Do that. Don't let the government of God come to you and you go to death by yourself. God wants to go to death with you. And the only way you can have that is put your faith in Christ. And if you haven't, just listen to our brother as he speaks. Let's open our Bibles again, please, to the Gospel by Matthew. Matthew, in the Old, uh, New Testament, and we want chapter 27. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 27, and we're going to read a little bit about the account of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 27, <clears throat> down to verse number 26. Then released he, that's Pilate, released Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus or whipped him, he delivered him to be crucified. Let's go down to verse 32. And as they came out, they followed a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. Uh, down to verse number 46. Uh, verse 45, now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Down to verse number 50, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain or ripped in two from top to the bottom. The earth did quake, the rocks rent, the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection, went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Now that is all we'll read, and we trust that God will bless the reading of his precious word. Now, uh, I would take perhaps maybe for granted, because unfortunately in the land in which we live, in the day in which we live, there are some people that are even uh, ignorant as to the facts surrounding Calvary. You take for granted a generation or two ago that people would at least know about the Lord Jesus and they would know about this place called Calvary and the event that took place there. But sad to say, we have run into some people and they are not aware of this. They have no idea as to what truly happened there. And so perhaps I'm taking a little liberty tonight in thinking that perhaps all here at least know about Calvary. You might not know the intricacies. You might not know all the things that went, took place there. But if someone mentioned to you about the Lord Jesus and Calvary, you would probably say, well, that's where he died. And that is common knowledge, thankfully, uh, through uh, uh, Hollywood uh, a few years ago, the Passion of the Christ. There was many people that were taken up as they went into those movie theater, the, theaters and they saw in graphic detail the things that took place there at Calvary. But you know, the interesting thing about that movie is that it was all pretty well uh, 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 imagined. They were, they were guessing as to what happened because the record, the word of God, it seems to be, for the most part, it seems to be uh, there, there is no record of the physical suffering, the physical side of the suffering of the Lord Jesus because that is what people would tend to dwell upon. That's what people would tend to, to focus on, and that's what people did, even with that movie. They focused on the, 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 the external things, and they were terrible things that happened to the Lord Jesus. But what is most important about Calvary 
is the spiritual work that, tra that, that, that took place at Calvary's cross. When the Lord Jesus paid the price for our sin. Because you see, with sin there comes price. Sin, there comes a cost. And the Lord Jesus was willing to pay that cost. I just want to think very quickly tonight about this place called Calvary. And when we think about Calvary, we cannot separate the person from the place. Uh, Calvary was a, uh, a common place at the time. Many people had died there. It was the, uh, it was the uh, a favorite place of the, Jew of the Roman leaders at that time to when they wanted to put someone to death to make a statement. They would, they would very publicly and very mercilessly lead people out to that place to crucify them. It was a horrific death. It was a death of anguish, a death of suffering, a death of pain. And so many people had died there. But it is this singular person that we want to focus on tonight, the Lord Jesus Christ. It was his death at Calvary that makes all the difference for men and women, boys and girls. I just have a few points here I want to think of when we consider Calvary. We've read a few things here in Matthew's Gospel. We know that there are four Gospels, and they all give us other little details, perhaps, that are not mentioned completely in the one Gospel. But Matthew's Gospel gives us many of the things that we want to consider tonight. I want you to think just for a minute, when it comes to Calvary, and I want to make this easy for you to understand, I want you to first think about the wonders, the wonders of Calvary. We read of some supernatural events that took place surrounding the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. As I said, many others had died at that very same spot, but this day, around his death, there were supernatural events that were experienced. Oh yes, maybe a one-off, we could say, well, that was just coincidence. But when you think of the number of events that took place when the Lord Jesus was crucified, we are made to understand that his death was unique. That this was not just uh, another criminal that they thought that they were crucifying, but rather it was, as we were hearing tonight, it, because it was creation itself that was groaning, it was the creator that was there on that cross for his creation. We read about the wonders of Calvary. Well, it says there from the sixth to the ninth hour, the sun was darkness. There was darkness over the whole land. Just when that orb should be in the sky at its brightest, for three hours, there was darkness over the whole land. There was a darkness that could not be penetrated. And the hymn writer has said, well might the sun in darkness hide and shut its glories in. When, when God, the incarnate creature, died for man, his creature's sin. And there the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who created the sun, was in darkness. We read also that the earthquake, earthquake, the earth shook, the rocks rent. That was different than the earth shaken. Literally, the rocks broke into pieces when the Lord Jesus was on the cross. You know, that's telling because a week earlier the Lord Jesus was coming into Jerusalem. And, and, and there were people there, and they were acknowledging him as the Messiah. They were saying, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. They were quoting prophecy from hundreds of years before in the little book of Zechariah. And the religious leaders came to the Lord Jesus, and they said, tell them to stop. Said, Do you hear what they're saying? Tell them to stop. And the Lord said, listen, if they stopped, he said the very rocks would cry out. And a week later, when all the voices stopped as far as mankind were concerned, the rocks shouted out, and the rocks proclaimed that this was the very Son of God. So the rocks quaked. The, the veil in the temple, that, that ceremonial veil that had kept man at a distance from God, when the Lord Jesus was on that cross, and, 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 and that it says that veil was ripped from the top to the bottom by an invisible hand, thus showing that a way had been made open for men to go into God. Before that, men were barred from God. Our sin, the law, kept us at a distance from God.
But when the Lord Jesus was there, the wonders of Calvary, that, that veil was ripped in two, and there they were able to go in to the holy of all. And even it says that there was a resurrection, a, a, a graves were open. And after the Lord's resurrection, there were some that were raised from the dead. Th think of the, the, the wonders. Think of the supernatural events that took place there at Calvary. But do you want to know what the greatest wonder of all when it comes to Calvary was? The greatest wonder that it was on the cross was the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the very creator, the God of heaven. He himself was on the cross and the whole creation was calling out. The whole creation was groaning and travailing as they understood that that was the creator that was on the cross. Oh, the wonders of his love. See him coming from above to atone and die for thee. Praise him, the, Bible, uh, the, the hymn writer says, praise him cheerfully. Oh, friend, the wonders of Calvary. Yes, men looked at those physical things that happened, but the greatest wonder was it was none other than God himself. God manifest in the flesh. But not only was it the wonders of Calvary that we read about, we read something about the words of Calvary. The four different gospel writers, there is recorded there at least seven distinct statements that the Lord Jesus made. I don't know if he said more, but the Spirit of God has recorded for us seven distinct statements that he made. Maybe you know some of them. There, were, there was the one he said as he was being led out to be crucified. And to those men that were taking him to nail him to a cross, he's saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That must have been strange to the ears of those men because they knew exactly what they were doing. They knew exactly that they were taking what they thought was another criminal out to be crucified. But oh, Paul says later on that they, they, they did not understand they did not know that they were taking the very Lord of life. And so, Father, forgive them. Uh, he, he is going to say to that thief on the one side, today, today will you be with me in paradise. That was another word that was recorded. He's going to look in the crowd, and, and there he's going to see his dear mother, Mary. And, and even in the midst of his agony, even in the midst of his anguish, he, he looks to the man beside her, which is the beloved apostle John, and he says, look after her. Take her to your home. And from that moment on, it says, John took her to his home. And so here's the Lord Jesus speaking these words. He, he, he is speaking words that men can hear. He is speaking words that God hears. And he is speaking words that all of creation hears. We read one of the words that he spoke, one of the statements. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In the midst of that darkness the Lord Jesus experienced that abandonment that our sins deserved. And as he, as, he, as he experiences the wrath of God and the judgment of God, he feels that he feels that separation, that abandonment. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As he comes out of the darkness, he utters those words, I thirst. They give him something to drink. He, he looks at all that's been done and he's going to say, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. But oh, the greatest word of Calvary was one word. Oh, it's three in our Bible, but it's one word in the original language and it's the word finished. It is finished. Oh, the greatest word of Calvary, the very work which his father had given him to do, the very purpose of him coming into this world had been, had been discussed in the, in the unity of the Godhead before there was ever creation. It was decided that the Father would send the Son to be the Savior of the world. And here now all the purposes of God, all the plans of God have come together to this particular specific point. And having suffered for sin, he is able to declare, it's done. It's finished. I have satisfied God. And because of that, sinners can have their sins forgiven. Sinners can have peace with God. We can be born into the family of God because the Lord Jesus has finished the work which God has given him to do. Oh, the words of Calvary. Yes, we, we, we pause and wonder to think that he, he was forsaken of God. 
we pause and wonder what it must have been as he felt that thirst as a result of the judgment of God. But oh, thankfully, we rejoice tonight because the work of salvation is finished. There is nothing left for you to do. When the Savior said, tis finished, everything was fully done. Done as God himself would have it, Christ the victory, fully won. Oh, friend, that's what salvation's about. Salvation is not about you doing something. Salvation is about you receiving what has already been done. Christ has satisfied God. The work is complete. It is done. And for the sinner, the soul that is searching to know peace, to know forgiveness, they can come to the Savior receiving him and come into the good of that finished work. You don't add to it. You don't put your two cents worth in. God only receives, accepts the finished work of Christ. And tonight, that's all you need. Oh, the words of Calvary. But not only did we read about the words of Calvary and the wonders of Calvary, we read something about the wounds of Calvary. You know, there's a statement that's made that we read, and it says, uh, he released unto them Barabbas, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. We can, we can read over that so quickly and not understand what that scourging was all about. The scourge was actually an instrument uh, created to elicit a confession even out of an innocent man. Such was the pain and the, 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 the horrendous agony when that cat of nine tails with the pieces of bone and rock as it would come down upon the back and literally tear the flesh off the back. Even an innocent man would, would call out saying that he was guilty just to stop, just to, to stop that scourge from coming down on his back. He delivered him to be scourged. We read in the Gospel by John, is it that Pilate delivered him to a band of soldiers? And it says they made sport of him. The Spirit of God has, has kept back what took place there. But we can only imagine the depravity of those soldiers who were, who were trained in the art of inflicting shame and pain upon their victims. They made sport of him. It says that they, they took a rod and, and they beat him on the head. It says that they, they, they pulled the beard from off his face. It says that, you know, they, they, they spit and they put a crown of thorns upon his head and they beat it down with a rod. Oh, the wounds of Calvary. That which he suffered, that, that which he suffered at the hands of men. But I hope you understand that there was far greater wounds at Calvary than what men inflicted upon the Lord Jesus Christ when he suffered physically in his body. Isaiah 53 it tells us very poignantly what the Lord Jesus Christ suffered at the hand of God. It says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with that stroke, the stroke of Almighty God coming down upon him, it says we are saved. There's a verse in Isaiah 53 again, and they are words that we will never truly comprehend where it says there that it pleased the Lord, it pleased God to bruise him. It wasn't that God was a sadist. There, there are people that delight in inflicting pain on others because they're sadistic. The reason it pleased God to do that because God understood the benefits that would come as a result of the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ. He must suffer for sin, the just for the unjust, that he will bring us to God. On Christ, almighty vengeance fell, enough to sink a world to hell. He bore it for a sinful race and thus became our hiding place. Those wounds, those precious wounds. You know, the hymn writer has said, a saved person looking forward to a coming day, said the cloudless day is coming, 
when thou, O Lord, shalt come, thy radiant beauty wearing to take thy people home. He goes on to say, but how shall I then know thee amid those hosts above? What tokens true will show me the object of my love? Thy wounds, thy wounds, Lord Jesus. Those deep, deep wounds will tell the sacrifice that saves us from sin and self and hell. Oh, the wounds of Calvary, wounded for me, wounded for me, there on the cross. He was wounded for me. What about you tonight, dear friend? Have you ever stopped and considered why he was at Calvary? He was there on your behalf. He was there taking your place and he was there being wounded for you. But not only is there the wonders of Calvary and the words of Calvary and the, weight of, uh, the, uh, the wounds of Calvary, but I want you to think of the weight of Calvary. We read there that um, as he came out, they found a man Simon uh, of Cyrene, Simon, and they compelled him to, to bear his cross. The other gospels tell us that this man Simon helped the Lord Jesus carry the cross out. Just imagine the physical condition of the Lord Jesus after being abused and scourged and, and now the weight of a cross has been put on him. And, and whether it was just the cross beam or whether it was the whole cross, whatever it was, it would have been an enormous weight. Just, just imagine that weight on his back as, as he's going now over a half a mile to the place called Calvary. From, from Pilate's Judgment Hall to, to Calvary was just over a half a mile outside the wall. And there he's carrying the weight on his back, that rough hewn piece of wood, the weight of the cross upon his back. What a weight, what a burden. But I hope you understand tonight that there was a far greater weight at Calvary than the cross that he carried out to that hill. When there he experienced the weight of the sin of the world that was put upon his back. We look at sin as something that's inconsequential, something that's not tangible. I want you to understand sin was tangible to the Savior that day. When he felt the weight of sin of the world placed upon his back, Isaiah says God laid on him the iniquity of us all. All our sins were laid upon him. Jesus bore them on the tree. God who knew them. He knows everything. And yet he laid them all upon his son. What a savior. He bore my sins in his own body on the tree. He was willing to suffer that horrific death for a sinner like me. He felt my sin, oh my sin. And, and I can just, I, I know the anguish and the grief that my own sin brings me. Imagine the sin of the world, the sin of all humanity placed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. The psalmist said, mine iniquities have gone over my head as a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. But oh, for Christ, thankfully, they were not too heavy because he bore in love unbounded what none could know. He was willing to bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Oh, the weight. Friend, would to God tonight you would understand the weight of your sin. Because sin is the problem. Sin is every single one of our problem. And it is that sin that will keep us out of God's heaven. And it doesn't need to. Because there was one who felt the weight of sin. Not only the weight of sin, but the corresponding judgment that that sin deserved. But you know, not only does we read about the weight of sin, uh, weight of Calvary. I want you to think tonight just for a minute about the wealth of Calvary. There, there were many offerings in the Old Testament that people had to bring because of sin. There was one offering in particular. It was called the trespass offering. When someone had trespassed against God in one some way or another, it's listed in the Old Testament, they would have to bring an offering and then add a fifth part thereof. So they had to bring 120% to make restitution for their sin. And, and, and that's what Calvary's all about. The Lord Jesus just didn't pay enough. <laughs> he paid more than enough. He has paid an infinite amount as far as what God demands for sin. 
And that's why with the wealth associated at Calvary, it doesn't matter what we've done. It doesn't matter how deep we have fallen into sin. There is an abundance associated with Calvary. There is wealth there where he is able and ready and willing to forgive sins. Listen, he's willing to forgive you tonight. In fact, that place called Calvary that was such an abhorrence that, that people shun back from, I want to tell you tonight, because of Calvary, there is a welcome available. The Lord Jesus is ready to welcome the sinner. He's saying, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you, learn of me, and, and we're to give him that burden, that burden of sin that is ours. We give it to him by trusting him. And we come in to this place called, uh, this place of salvation where we have the forgiveness of sins. And it's all because of Calvary. All because of what the Savior did there that day. And that is why there is such futility in ever thinking that there is something I can do. You don't have to do anything. All has been done. And tonight just as a, a guilty sinner, just like I was a number of years ago, I realized my sin was the problem. And that wonderful verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 3, Christ died for my sins. It was for me. Yes, all for me. I wonder, was it for you tonight? It could be, if you just accept Christ, even as we pray. Father, we are so thankful again for the Lord Jesus, for the gospel. What, what a message, Father. It's something that men could have never thought up. It, it, it's so simple, and yet it is so profound. The Father would send the Son to be the Savior of the world. And so we're thankful that in this day of grace, there is still opportunity. There is still a door that is open so that whosoever will, by putting their trust in the Lord Jesus in that finished work, they can have the forgiveness of sins, be born into the family of God, Father, and all the blessings that come with it. What a wonderful salvation this is. So bless each one that's here tonight. God bless each one. And Father, most important, say by thy grace, in that precious name, Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Thanks again for coming. Remember the meetings as they continue each night this week. We're going to just sing two verses of 132. On Calvary's brow my Savior died. T'was there my Lord was crucified. T'was on the cross he bled for me and purchased there my pardon free. <clears throat> we'll sing verse 2 and 3 and the chorus 132. Mid rending rocks and darkening skies, my Savior bows his head and dies. The opening veil reveals the way to heaven's joys and endless day. Say.